All right, so let's take a look at graphs. So graphs are not always the most super interesting thing to everyone, right? Everybody groans when we look at graphs or have you graph stuff in science class. But graphs um, tell great stories. So in science, a graph is a visual representation of a relationship between two variables. So we have an x variable, right? This is our x-axis. And we have a y variable. Here's our y-axis. And our x variable is always going to be our independent variable, right? So we're always looking at two different things and we're comparing different things on graphs. Independent variable, and this is our dependent variable. So our independent variable is what causes a change or what you change. This is what reacts to the change. So it's the resultant of the change. So as I change this, this also changes, right? But this change is dependent on what I do here. All right, so. All right, so we might look at a graph. You know, and we see something like this, where we see some change over time. We're always reading in this direction. Um, so from left to right, just like we read in a book, right? We read from the left to the right. And Maybe we want to think about this as we're kind of reading what the story is telling us. We're going to see that all of our graphs have a title at the top, and this is going to tell us what the graph is about, so what the data is that we're looking at. Here, down here, where our x and our y axis meet, that is called the origin, right? So that might be similar to what you learned in math class. Um, and we're going to look at what is happening to this graph over time. So we're going to think about this as little uh, Mario. So we got Super Mario right here, right? Um, and we start Mario World at the beginning, right? So we're at our origin. And over here is when Mario reaches the flagpole, right? So and he gets to the end of the world. And so as he Mario goes through that world, he traverses lots of different terrain, uh, terrain, right? And so he goes up and he goes down, and he maybe he goes down um, a tunnel, down into an underworld, and he pops back up over here somewhere later on in the in the world. Um, and then he reaches here, reaches the end, and he reaches the flagpole. He jumps on the flagpole, and he's completed that world. All right. So we're looking at you know Mario's path through through the world. All right, so we might look at a graph, right, with our x and our y axis <clears throat> that shows time and maybe the number of coins that you collected during your Mario world, right? Right, so we see some change over time, and what we do is we kind of break up the graph into these very interesting different time periods. And so when we were looking at our distance time graphs, when we were doing those analysis, we were kind of breaking the graph up into these individual different points where, where the um, graph was changing over time. So we have time here of zero, here's maybe our first time, here's our second time third time, our fourth time, and we're looking at what happens to the graph in these two in these different times. 
right? So it goes up, it goes down, it goes way up there, it goes way down there, it goes up again, and then it's down again, and then it's up, right? So we look at some of the patterns that happen in this graph over time. So graphs can tell us a lot of things. You've heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a graph is a picture of our data in science class. So a graph can take the place of a lot of words and a lot of explaining of data. And we are still going to yet to use some words, but we can tell a lot and we can do a lot of analysis and show a lot of our results just by using a graph. So, we collect our data in data tables, but then we analyze our data and we analyze the results in a graph. So maybe this is five, ten. All right, so I have a pH of the water and I've got the number of tadpoles over here. And so I'm gonna just kinda draw a couple points. On this graph. And so here, I'm going to highlight it so that we can see it in a different color. And so this graph tells us a lot of different things. It tells us our, the pH of the water, which is our independent variable. Right? So it's an independent. And when I ask you to do annotations, I'm asking you to kind of write some of these different things on the graph, right? So writing, just like when we do reading annotations, we do uh, annotations on our graph as well as we help ourselves explain what the graph is showing us. And so we have these individual different points here, here, and here. And what we're looking at is like how does changing the pH of water change how many tadpoles I have? All right, so what we can see is there's a couple different questions we can ask based on this graph. So you might um, be asked, um, where was the greatest change in tadpole population uh, seen on the graph? And so we can look at this graph and we can tell right off the bat that the steepest slope is here. The greatest change is going to be our steepest slope. And so we can determine that because we have a very even placement on our x-axis. So we have an even distribution on our x-axis. So we can say that the steepest point is going to be the greatest change. All right, so this is going to be our greatest change in the number of tadpoles. All right, so we could also, you could also be asked, what is the optimal pH for tadpoles to exist in. And so again, the optimal pH, optimal meaning best, is going to be the pH where we had the most amount of tadpoles. So this is going to be our optimal pH for tadpoles. And we can take this and we can read it right off the graph. And in this case, it's right in between eight and nine, so our optimal pH is gonna be 8.5. All right, just based on this quick little graph here. All right, so let's take a look at some other things that we can see on different graphs. So on graphs, we can also make a determination based on data trends. So, if this is a graph on stress versus anxiety, right? we're going to have a title again on our graph and it's going to be related to the information that it's presenting. And here we have no stress, here we have high stress, we have no anxiety, we have high anxiety. 
and we see a pattern that kind of looks like this. So I don't know about you, but I always have some for some amount of anxiety, even if I have no stress whatsoever. So I'm starting my graph here. But based on this data that we're looking at, we can see that the more stress you have, the higher anxiety you will have. And there's a correlation there, right? So that's a relationship between these two variables. And we can say that the less stress equals low anxiety, All right? So I just determined some relationships just looking at this one single simple line, line graph. We can also say that this shows a positive trend, right? So it's in the positive direction, so, it's a, so we're saying it's a positive trend. If we have a line that goes in the opposite direction, we have a graph that shows like this, this is going to be a negative trend. Right? So this is these are some different trend lines. And so sometimes you're going to have to put a trend line on a graph then and determine whether or not it's positive or negative. So so looking at what the data is showing us. Alright. So Take a look at some more patterns that we can determine in our graphs. So, again, we have a graph, and maybe this is the seasons of the year, and we're looking at ice cream sales. All right, and so we've got spring, summer, fall. Winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, and so on. And what we see is, is that ice cream sales peak in the summertime. And so you might see a trend that goes up like this, and it kind of comes down, and then it peaks again comes down, peaks again, comes down, peaks again, and then peaks, maybe peaks again over there. And so what we see is that there's a regular pattern of when ice cream sales increase. So we can say that we have a regular pattern of peaks, right? So these are our peaks, these are our troughs. These are our troughs. So we have regular peaks, a regular pattern of peaks and troughs on a regular interval. Right? So we can predict that our ice cream sales are going to peak in the summertime and that we're going to have a dip in sales maybe in the winter time or in the fall towards the winter time. Right? So we this is called a seasonal pattern, right? So we have a, there's a regular pattern. And so seasonality doesn't necessarily relate it to um, the seasons itself. It just means that there's a regular pattern that happens, a regular pattern of peaks and troughs. Um, they happen at the same time every year. Um, they could happen at the same day of the week, so it might be you might see some seasonality if it happens like every when Monday something peaks, um, or um, on Tuesdays Market Basket gets their deliveries, so they have a peak in sales on Tuesdays as everybody rushes to the store to get fresh produce. So that would be a seasonal pattern because you can see some regular consistent patterns over time. All right, so we can also, with a seasonal pattern, predict over the, over the next cycle when we're going to have those peaks. All right, so when we see this, it happens at a consistent rate, we can predict 
that the next summer, so I can predict that there's going to be a trough here, and that the following summer over here sometime, we're going to have another peak. We're not sure what, what height that peak might be. It might not, might not always be at the same level, but we can determine that there is going to be a peak. All right, so we're just looking at some, have some seasonal patterns overall. So some other patterns we can look at. And what is, what is the data doing over time? And we might see you know, a graph like this. And maybe we're looking at time, just kind of over time. And we're looking at maybe stock options. All right, and so we're seeing, we can identify here are our peaks. Right, we have all these different peaks. And then we have these areas of kind of some troughs. Here's an area here, there's an area here. But the, the troughs and the peaks don't occur on a regular pattern. So this trough is, you know, kind of short, but this one there's a long dip in, um, in the troughs, um, and then it kind of peaks again. So maybe this is like, you know, the comp there's a company buyout or something, and so the stock options go up. Um, but then, um, you know, the options kind of drop a little bit and then we buy out another company, right? And so we can see that there might be patterns in when it happens, but it's not based on time itself, all right? So this means that there's, um, it does not have an obvious pattern in the variation. So it has peaks, it has valleys, it has troughs, but there's no actual pattern. So we call this a cyclical pattern. In a cyclical pattern, you could also have a trend, right? This data shows a negative trend. So overall, the data is decreasing, right? So we're getting decreasing in the number of stock options. So it's, it's, it has a negative trend, but it's not a regular pattern. So it's a cyclical pattern. All right, so one more pattern that you could observe in your data might look like this. All right, so again, we've got some peaks, we've got some troughs, but there's no consistent pattern. There's no, we don't have a peak and then followed by a trough, followed by another peak, followed by another trough. We've got a peak here, we've got a really long point where it's kind of low, we've got another peak here, and then it's kind of low, and then it drips way down over here, and we have a little peak here. So there's absolutely no pattern. So. There's no obvious pattern at all, right? And so this is a random pattern. When we're looking at it kind of over time. So one of the other things that we can do with our data is what's called interpolating and extrapolating. Okay, interpolating and extrapolating. So here we have a graph. And this is maybe is the number of fish. And this is maybe teaspoons of fish food. So how much fish food do I need for the number of fish that I have? So this again is my independent variable. This is my dependent variable. And sometimes in science class, 
we either don't have the equipment, we don't have the time, right? Because we're always limited by the, the amount of time that we are in class. And so we don't have the, the capacity in order to um, take and collect data for every little point that we might want to. Right? And so we might have this graph. We might only have three data points or four data points, right? So we can still put them on a graph, and it might not show um, exactly what's happening, but it shows enough that we can make some other inferences based on the data. And so let me just label my y-axis. So, based on this data, right, we've got three data points. We could ask what, we've got data for 20 fish, we've got data for 45 fish, and we've got data for 70 fish, right? But what if we had 40 fish? Well, then we take here, we go to 40, we draw, come up to the line, right? And then we come over. So how much food am I going to need? I'm going to need about 32.5 teaspoons of food for that many fish. So if I have 40 fish, I'm going to need about 32.5 teaspoons of food. Now it seems a little bit high right now. Um, but again, this is just kind of a made up scenario. Um, and so that is what is called interpolating the data. So we're looking between two points. And we're interpolating, right, we're kind of figuring out, we're inferring what the value is of a point we did not collect. All right, so we're looking between those two points and trying to find a specific point. We could also extrapolate the data and so that means is that we're kind of extending our graph beyond the first and the last points and we typically do that with a dashed line right because we don't have the data for that those points yet but we're just kind of extrapolating beyond the data and again we're gonna say like what if we have only 10 fish right we don't have data for that but we can look here at the graph. We, we extrapolate out the line um, of the graph. We're going to go up here, and just like we did with the other one, and we're going to come over and try to figure out how much food we're going to need. And here we're 10, here's the 15. We're a little bit closer to the 15, so I'm going to guess it's about 14. So we need about 14 teaspoons for 10 fish, if I have 10 fish. I could also do it on the other end as well. So here we have data up to about 70. But what if I have 80 fish? I can come up here to my 80, right? Come over to my extrapolated line. And again, just kind of draw that line over. I'm halfway between 55 and 60. So that's 57 and a half would be our halfway point. So I can say I need about 57.5 teaspoons of fish for that many. Um, teaspoons of food for 80 fish. All right, so that extrapolating means we are extending past the smallest and largest data points to infer what the data might be. Right, so we're making some assumptions, we're making some inferences. We can also say, based on this data, right, that there's a positive trend. Right, so the more fish I have, more fish equals more food I'll need. So look at all that information we just pulled off of that graph. 
right? It was just a simple three-point line, but yet it tells us a lot of information. So, a picture is worth a thousand words.